Hello, everyone. Good evening. And welcome to the first event of trust in the blockchain society. I'm Leonardo de la Noce, editor of Arkis and project manager of this specific project. Um, it's great to start this series of events we co-developed with uh, Pakaus Zweiger. And uh, I'm here to tell you not much about the event of tonight, because we're going to have a moderator, Francesco degli Innocenti, but to tell you about the broader project we're working on. So together with Summering Channel, uh, some of you might know them, Amsterdam-based documentary and uh, film company. We are developing an interactive documentary about the blockchain, featuring a series of interviews of interesting and relevant voices that come from both within and beyond the blockchain space. So this is our first, uh, let's say, public, uh, public event. And tonight, the two speakers will also be featured in our um, documentary that is going to be out in fall 2020. So stay tuned for that. We're going to have other two events in this series. Uh, if you want to join us again, one on the 1st of April and one on the 24th of April. So without further um, ado, I would like to uh, introduce Francesco Degli Innocenti, who is the moderator of tonight and uh, uh, collaborator on this project. Hello, everybody. I am uh, one of the editors of uh, Volume Magazine, part of Archis. Um, today, one thing it's important to be said in the beginning, we're not going to talk about the technical aspects or the technological aspects of the blockchain. So do not expect that. Um, what we want to talk about is actually um, the design agency that this new space of services um, allow, um, allow designers actually. Um, why we do that is because 40 years of um, 40 years of neoliberal policies have completely distorted uh, the geography between public and private. Um, we see that the public space is in retreat, probably too hard to maintain, uh, probably too expensive, and at the same time, the private has completely taken over and started eroding. Uh, all services that before were for were for um, were governed by the public. Um, yet, let's say ownership itself um, has evolved uh, due to the collapse um, of the, pub the 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 digital and the physical. Actually, dividing the two by now is misleading to say the least, and it's often. Um, a sign of poor media literacy. But what are the opportunities really for designers in this uh, ever-changing landscape? And if we actually let go of this dichotomy between public and private uh, and frame it based on agency, for example, uh, new possibilities for designers arise, we think. Um, in one issue of the of Volume magazine, we tried to frame it as civic space. We were calling it, basing it on um, the, a the, the interaction between the ambitions of different agents, um, where actually humans are only one of the agents uh, present in these, this new landscape. Uh, but so is the self-driving car that decides to turn left, and so is the self-owning tree that um, leverages its data um, for its own protection, organizing it in a cooperative. Um, that being said, actually, what type of space, what type of uh, space can be created in this constant negotiation between the ambitions of different agents. This is one thing that we want to understand also today and within the series. Without further ado, um, I want actually uh, to introduce the first speaker. 
Arthur uh, Roing Bayer. He's uh, he's the the founder uh, of several blockchain projects and now manages um, one space in Berlin that he calls uh, a space for platform conspiracy, where he's developing uh, several new models um, of ownership, um, dealing also with this type of technology. Arthur, if you want. Thank you. Um, I will go to my little computer here. Um, so yeah, um, I started Trust uh, with some other people, including Callum Bowden, who's also one of the co-founders of the project. Um, um, but um, we're approximately, I would say, 20 people who are somehow involved with the project. Um, yeah, um, I don't know if my slides are here. Yes, they are. So um, I, um, as was said, I have some background in the blockchain space, but also, uh, among other things, study design here in Amsterdam at the Sandberg Institute. So I'm going to try to frame in this talk maybe mm, both um, why um, there has been at least some interest from the design community um, with within blockchain or like what has been projected onto it maybe. Um, then looking at maybe some kind of like overview or framework for understanding it as a design space. And then looking at some examples, uh, pulling apart uh, or like testing out the framework on those examples. And the examples I've chosen are things I've been involved in and that I think maybe uh, are things that should be built. Um, so blockchain as a design space. Um, yeah, there's a Pokemon research lab. Um, I think like um, what, what I think is maybe important to mention first is that it feels like there's been this, uh, like I've, over the last, I would say, four years, there's been a number of practitioners who've gone into, uh, gone into blockchain with a kind of frustration with their own fields. And I think this is both in architecture, this has been in graphic design, uh, and this has been in art seeing somehow that their own practices no longer have the kind of agency that maybe was promised to them when they were studying or what they projected on the field. And blockchain by kind of um, defining, being able to define the economic and maybe legal contracts that your work uh, is uh, built through uh, has given maybe a glimpse of being to change the, uh, the kind of uh, context or uh, financial realities that your, your, your work is an output at the end of. Um, and <coughs> Keller Easterling called these, this relationship between what maybe is, yeah, uh, the building, the development firm and architecture or the art market and art uh, or uh, the advertising industry and graphic design as active and object form, where object form uh, can only be as free as the active form uh, that generates it uh, allows it to be. And if we want to make, maybe uh, today, want to make design work uh, that has uh, maybe political impact or has some, tries to have some political agency, we should focus on forms of design that have an active form and that can somehow uh, uh, you know, impact the context that it's in. Otherwise, it will be co-opted by the active form um, uh, that generates it. So, <coughs> and here, Blockchain kind of, at least theoretically, um, allows active forms out of the box by allowing execution uh, without the need uh, of a trusted third party of contractual agreements and financial uh, mechanisms. It opens up basically economics and law, uh, which traditionally have had to rely on institutional kind of uh, execution um, as design spaces uh, directly for let's say a new, <laughs> an, uh, a new group of designers. And that, this is kind of the promise. Um, so um, so what, we, what I want to do is kind of look at when you start doing that, what is the actual possibilities of designing within this space? <coughs> and um, I've sketched out a very simple framework for this talk, which looks at like different aspects when you, when you design a decentralized system or a blockchain system. Um, and um, 
like I'm going to try to go through these quickly and then we can look at two kind of projects uh, through this lens as well. And uh, yeah, um, I hope this is somewhat clear at least. So the first is <coughs> self-executing contracts or smart contracts, uh, which are a way to um, deploy uh, programmatically defined rules um, on the blockchain or a decentralized ledger, uh, which means that they can be executed without the need for a third party, either uh, directly, continuously, at a certain time, or linked to specific external inputs. A way, a very, uh, um, let's say if I come up with an example now, um, one way of like defining such a contract would be um, um, if I give a service to someone, they transfer me 100 euros, um, we make that contract and if that happens, I will get the 100 euros and they cannot, after the contract has been deployed, they cannot change it. So there's a, a kind of what, what a, um, what a th trusted third party would do normally can now be done uh, uh, without the need for a third party, basically. It's a way to like just formalize a contractual agreement, use the, the ledger as a third party, and it removes the need for a th yeah, so third party. The second is uh, programmable money, um, or as they're commonly known, tokens, which means that <coughs> money or measurements of value or uh, means of payment is turned into a, a malleable, designable medium uh, that can evolve, uh, change shape over time, and take different uh, shapes uh, that react to external inputs. Um, example, um, money that loses its value after half a year if it's not used, for example. Um, and and you, you it introduces a number of new parameters to uh, the design space of, uh, of money, yeah. Uh, the third, um, is a governance, um, um, and one second. Um, so, as one of the goals of this, uh, of many of these, uh, let's say, decentralized ledgers, is to allow execution of contracts without mediation. <coughs> it's extremely important that when there, uh, that any updates or changes of parameters within those contracts have like a governance structure that also in the same way isn't manipulatable by the parties involved in the potential transactions. So if I would have done this uh, thing where um, uh, someone puts up 100 euros and uh, I have to uh, deliver service for those 100 euros, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's important that uh, uh, changing the parameters of that contract has a certain either none or a certain governance mechanism that doesn't allow manipulation. So um, that's extremely important in the design of blockchain system, which, which brings us to our next point, which is identity. And here, um, this means who and what can interact with the contracts, uh, the programmable money, and the governance mechanisms. Because as a blockchains as Ethereum are public and permissionless out of the box, um, meaning uh, that any entity can interact with them, uh, how do we know what is interacting with it? And uh, this seems like a small problem, but without the equivalent of something like social security numbers or passports, how do we know that the entities voting, transferring funds, or reconfiguring the contracts are humans or whatever we want them to be? And uh, many blockchain systems are agnostic to this human and, uh, uh, let's say, non-human uh, uh, division, and instead uh, use something called uh, a wallet address is like the normal way to uh, uh, know wh who someone is. And um, uh, user, uh, user uh, votes or interactions are weighted based on their capital liquidity, uh, which is great theoretically because it uses the general value for voting, for example, and it uh, create can create security uh, by the person's capital or money being at risk uh, when they misbehave but also it, uh, it uh, directly turns many of these governance systems into photocracies because there's no way to uh, distribute votes uh, in, a, in a different way. So you vote with your money, basically. So here uh, is again the <laughs> now the, the kind of active form as filled out with those four parts. Uh, and uh, uh, now what? Um, how do we, what do we want to design with this? And I will sketch out two examples of what I'm interested in. 
and uh, uh, they both are from the field of labor and logistics. So Commune is a project I did in Amsterdam in 2016. Um, it basically is a reaction to this, which is um, geo geographic density is a new network effect, uh, which is basically the theory of Uber um, for ta taxi uh, density. It's a kind of a logic that says as, uh, um, as uh, uh, Uber grows, there will be more geographic coverage, meaning saturation, which means that there are less driver downtime and faster pickups, lower prices, more demand, more drivers. And it, it bases itself on this kind of uh, bro um, positive feedback loop of growth that will at some point, at least in cities that aren't like Amsterdam where you can't drive in, uh, will promise to kind of replace uh, public transport systems. Or at least that was the sales pitch, which has somewhat been, uh, I mean, it's not going that well right now. But that was the uh, sales pitch back then, um, which kind of uh, already then had this kind of promise of replacing or at least uh, substituting public transport systems in certain areas. And I was interested in um, if one wants to both kind of solve the uh, problematic uh, labor practices, or not solve, but at least um, um, help these uh, labor practices uh, by creating um, a, um, a kind of cooperative or um, worker-owned ownership model for these platforms. Um, how can you do that while also ensuring that long-term, uh, as we potentially transition into automation, uh, we can turn this infrastructure that grows out of it into something like a public utility? and uh, and is there a way to use a blockchain uh, protocol to distribute and uh, transition that ownership to both the kind of collective ownership, but then later into something like a public utility? And um, the kind of thing I came up with is fairly simple. It, um, it basically distributes ownership shares to uh, taxi drivers and passengers when they use the service. Um, these ownership shares guarantee a partial uh, ride fee distribution, something like a tax on all transactions within the system, which um, uh, helps the drivers because they um, uh, now have a um, st more stable income and can plug in insurance and stuff like that into it. And um, the idea is that the, um, um, the ownership shares die after a while. Um, so it guarantees that uh, people that are active within the system um, um, have like governance and get part of the redistribution of funds. And uh, if we look at it in this kind of framework, um, the self-executing contracts are like taxi fare contracts, ownership share distribution. Uh, the ownership shares are this kind of token which, uh, which goes down over time. Uh, the governance uses a form of liquid democracy where uh, basically people can use to either delegate their votes to someone or their votes are w and their votes are weighted by ownership shares. Um, and the identity is that uh, users are simply identified via their transactions, and their drivers are um, uh, identified by a, a local organization. So you, you can divide the drivers from the passengers based on uh, maybe a local union or something like that. Mm, okay, that was one, using this um, first example of these uh, uh, this Four, four principles or design framework thing. Um, the second is um, the vertical union DAO, uh, which comes out of a research group at Trust called the Vertical Union uh, Working Group. Um, and uh, the it origin is from a paper written or an article written with uh, Nick Hood uh, on, on vertical unions. And <coughs> it tries to uh, look at the problem of uh, that unions have had a hard time adapting to the scale and verticality of global supply chains. Um, and one of the main drivers of this problem uh, is that as a union blocks a single factory today, uh, the supply chain uh, can simply reroute activities around them, uh, mitigating the most damage of the flow of the product. Um, so this means that if you actively want to shut down a flow of a product and damage the, uh, like increase the leverage of the union, um, you need to uh, create cross-factory, cross-industry uh, unions, uh, something Nick Hood calls vertical unions. But the question is, how do we facilitate uh, that uh, several unions can strike together, and how can a commitment of strike 
uh, be enforced when the organizational form and scale is so large that the normally used kind of social and legal, sometimes legal, <laughs> uh, protocols uh, that normally uh, are used to prevent strike breaking, they fall apart at this scale. Um, and here we looked at like a similar uh, proposal, a protocol proposal, where individual uh, union uh, members or chapters have their social and legal framework, which already exists today, uh, uh, and they are united into local unions. And then those local unions through representatives uh, stake uh, collateral when they want to strike into a, a, a shared contract. Uh, and that creates a vertical union that then uh, is like an enforcement uh, uh, contract for striking. That's basically it. And if we look at the, uh, um, the uh, under through the same lens, um, the self-executing contract would be strike commitment and enforcement. Uh, the uh, stablecoin will be something, uh, the programmable money would be something like stablecoin, uh, which is um, uh, a token uh, that acts no almost like a fiat currency, so it doesn't fluctuate in value. Um, the governance mechanism would be delegated democracy through the union representatives, and the uh, identity would be basically that selected unions are given access uh, by the other members and given some kind of access code. And this is, I, yeah, this is a, a I tried to make a somewhat clear overview of some of the design decisions that go into when you make something like this. Um, and hopefully made it more legible uh, than it's normally presented. Um, I, uh, <laughs> that, that was uh, my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very interesting, uh, ca also case studies. Uh, then um, Kai, uh, uh, Kia, Kia. Jesus Christ, <laughs> it's yeah. Um, Kia, you can come on stage. Kia Kreudler uh, is a researcher and an artist. Uh, she's headed strategy of at Gnosis, <laughs> and I keep pronouncing her name wrong, but uh, she forgives me, I think, by now. Um, Um, she's going to talk about Gnosis mm, briefly uh, as well, but her project-based practice uh, focuses on uh, new cosmograms. Uh, you will see about that, and, and also utopian conspiracies. Thanks so much for inviting me to talk. So yeah, my name is Kia, I work at Gnosis. We work on prediction market platforms, trading protocols, and wallets on the Ethereum blockchain. And part of what I'm talking about tonight will relate to my work at Gnosis, but mostly it will be a kind of personal speculation on where I think the confluence of different technologies will go. So the talk is called Guilds, Kin, Markets, Crypto Networks, in reference to the RAND report about different types of organizations in the future. And just to start off with a few definitions, because I don't necessarily know where the audience is at with this technology, and rather than give a kind of static technical definition or go too much in depth, I like to give an active definition of blockchain. So I would define blockchain as a protocol that enables a decentralized public record of interactions between people without guaranteeing institutions like a notary. And with just the caveat that by people, I also mean accounts, addresses, as Arthur mentioned, but also companies, AI, agents, entities, anything that could interact with a digital system. And people often use the term distributed ledger, but there's also other terms like public collaborative scroll, so you could imagine one in the center of a town hall that everyone can contribute to and you know it is correct. And so you might be familiar with blockchain because of Bitcoin, but there's a lot of other blockchain platforms as well. And the one that I work on primarily and the ecosystem I work on is called Ethereum. Um, so I love the, and it was, yeah, I love the origin story of Ethereum. So this is a quote from one of the co-founders and the technical designer of Ethereum. So he said, um, and this is still in his bio today, um, I happily played World of Warcraft during 2007 through 2010, but one day Blizzard, um, this is the company that maintains World of Warcraft, removed the damage component from my beloved Warlock Siphon Life Spell. I cried myself to sleep, and on that day I realized what horrors 
centralized services can bring. I soon decided to quit. So uh, that was 2010, and then in 2011, enter Ethereum. So it was launched the first, well, there was various series, but kind of co-founded shortly after that, and the first block was mined in 2016. Um, so Ethereum extends the ideas behind Bitcoin by providing decentralized digital currency, but also providing a general programming framework and ecosystem built on the blockchain itself. So that means that you can build decentralized applications on top of Ethereum, and in these applications, or independently, you can choose to issue different types of currency with custom logic. And these different types of currency issued on the blockchain are called tokens. And so in Ethereum, particularly within that culture of Ethereum, not necessarily in Bitcoin, um, and within other blockchain projects as well, a lot of people are thinking equally about decentralization on a technical level, but also what that means for social organizations and what kind of structures that will produce. So the main focus of the talk will be on this idea of DAO, which Arthur briefly mentioned. Um, so it was a term that first came about in 2014, and the original phrase decentralized autonomous organization was very much about kind of unstoppable, um, non-censorable businesses. So being able to put your business on a blockchain and no one can shut it down. But since then, it has evolved quite a lot, and the projects that have manifested have shown a different ethics. So today I would give an active definition of a DAO as a software tool that lowers the associated costs of starting an organization. So if you've ever kind of tried to smart start like a small cooperative with friends or a larger company, you realize that it's actually incredibly time consuming and can be incredibly expensive to get basic infrastructure like a shared bank account. So DAOs seek to solve that problem. And additionally, they use a form of incentive design to coordinate members towards accomplishing common goals. So this can be economic incentives, it can be social capital related incentives or otherwise. And there are a lot of imagined qualities of what DAOs could bring that we haven't seen manifested in the world yet. I won't go into all of these qualities, but one that's important to imagine <coughs> is that DAOs have this idea of like hyperscalability. So most companies um, become less efficient as they scale. That means that there's more organizational overhead, there's more overlap and redundancy and just in terms of the knowledge that that organization protects. And the ideas of DAOs is that actually as it becomes more scalable and larger, it becomes more efficient and easier able to replicate knowledge across its different kind of departments, let's say. And what it, a DAO is in practice is much different than that. So this is a simple DAO. It was um, the Gnosis Safe. So most people know the Gnosis Safe as a multi-signature wallet, a way to, for a group of people to collectively hold crypto funds together. But you can think of it as a DAO, and I'll walk you through how. Um, so this is just a regular Chrome browser, you can go to it, and this is the Guild DAO, um, and I am a member of this multi-sig Guild DAO. And the DAO has an address at the top, it's a unique hash that is the address of this DAO on the Ethereum blockchain, and it has four members as well, of which I am one, and each of the members have their own unique address. And what this software allows is that in order to, there's, and it holds a share pool of funds between all of the members. And what the software allows is that um, in order to send those funds anywhere else or receive funds, three out of four of the member addresses have to approve that transaction. So while it's a relatively simple software tool, as long as you port that into like organizational design, then you get like a small cooperative where it has articles of association that say like 75% of members have to approve an action um, in order for it to be executed and acted upon. So we already get a small kind of cooperative logic even going here. But then there are also more complex versions of DAOs, and this was another project I worked on called the DX DAO. And the idea behind this one is that it's an organization where people make proposals and vote on those proposals to govern software. And so the DX DAO was built to be a DAO owned not by Gnosis, the company that I work at, but owned by a community of participants. So it was initialized by Gnosis in April 2019. There was a one month period during which participants could lock, not spend, but just lock, tokens to earn voting power. And during this one month, there was more than 21 million USD equivalent locked, and there was 399 participants, which for a relatively niche experimental software project was actually on the higher end. Um, and the DXDAO now autonomously governs software trading protocols. So what does that look like in practice? Um, this is another just screenshot, regular browser Chrome. Anyone can go and visit this. So this is a proposal to the DAO, um, basically just to regi register a domain name for one of the software protocols that the DAO governs. And you can see in the kind of top right corner there, there's votes for and against. This particular proposal only has votes for. Um, but it's basically like a glorified voting software on the blockchain. 
And this is someone who's a member of the DXDAO who presented last week in Denver on it. And right now he just gives a super short overview of like what all of the DAO does. Um, so it runs Ethereum nodes, IPF gateways, domain names, governs an auction protocol, is a prediction market oracle. And you don't necessarily need to be familiar with those technical terms, but just to give a sense of it's doing quite a lot in the software space and governing quite a lot of protocols. Um, so the DXDAO today consists of a voting interface, which I previously showed. It also consists of earned reputation tokens. So these aren't necessarily financial tokens, but they're more like a kind of social capital currency. And you earn more as you participate more in a way that other members deem good. Um, and there's also other economic incentive layers, which I won't go into here, but it's a kind of complex protocol about how the DAO governs itself with different incentives. And apart from being a technical project, it is also fundamentally a social project. So the people involved in the DAO have weekly calls to talk over proposals and decide what to do next. And they also finance member work from a shared pool of funds. So they finance as well as software development, they also do branding and communication for the software projects that they govern. And all of this is to the ultimate end of governing and launching new decentralized software products. And I would say a lot of people talk about DAOs as fixing huge societal problems. Um, so a lot of people in Ethereum will be like, DAOs can solve climate change. And for me, I feel like because they are early safe stage software tools, DAOs most applicable first use case is governance of other software protocols, including their development, funding, and maintenance. But still, um, so <laughs> many people accuse those building DAOs and using DAOs of kind of reinventing the wheel. So you look at cooperatives using software and you say, wow, this is incredible. This is a hugely novel form. And even though I think that is on some level very correct, um, DAOs definitely don't learn enough from the past and people who are designing these systems don't learn enough from the past. I also think that cooperatives using software is a hugely novel form in the history of kind of humankind. Um, so we haven't yet seen the possibilities of what types of projects and ethics that will produce. And in terms of what DAOs can bring to kind of software development in general, so people have been maintaining like open source software for decades, right? And people have done it in non-hierarchical, transparent ways. People have done it in more centralized ways. So what's different now if DAOs can kind of govern software? And for this, I looked to a piece by Nathan Schneider that was actually published in September of last year called Startups Need a New Option, Exit to Community. So the idea with this piece is often, um, you know, startups have two general paths when they become successful. One is corporate acquisition. So maybe your company is bought by a corporation like Google. Or maybe it's an IPO, where shares in your company start being traded on the stock exchange. And both of these are a little bit counterintuitive for producing a product that earns value for its founders as well as for its members and acts in an ethical way. So in this essay, Nathan highlights a kind of speculative new form, which I think will really gain traction. And he calls it exit to community, or E2C. So it's the idea that once you've built a product, you have a user base, and you're looking what to do next with it. So you could say in the example of Twitter, what do you do rather than doing an IPO? You could do something where whether it's crypto tokens or whether it's just governance rights or votes on new features, give the value that platform has created to its members and to its users because it's most likely that those users will have the best insight on what to do next rather than kind of distant shareholders or larger companies that will strip them for parts. And so I would say that the DXDAO is an example of software protocol that exited to a DAO community, so did ET2C already. And the one thing that's also important me to mention here is that DAOs already encode an economic layer. Um, so they allow you to be able to say that we already have this economic incentive layer and we know that at this certain point in time we will give it over to our users. And you could even hard code that if you so desired to. Whereas like normal social media platforms or other things would be very hard to kind of ensure that that would happen. But in terms of all technical projects, probably what's most important is a cultural layer too. And how can you assure that kind of community values are aligned with your platform's values. So one place I like to look towards is gaming. So exit to community can also be a useful, soft, uh, useful concept for software, including games. So if you look back at the DAO kind of definition as a software tool that lowers the cost of starting orgs, as well as incentive design to keep people towards common goals, you could almost substitute this definition for guilds. So what are guilds? Um, so massive multiplayer online role-playing game guilds. Um, guilds are groups of players in MMORPGs who work together towards roughly common goals. And within these guilds, diversity of skill sets and roles are key for raiding, so beating levels, raiding dungeons, getting inventory items, and other tasks that might be in a game world. 
So tanks, healers, damage per second are some of these very important strategic roles. And after a raid or a successful level completion, um, members of the guild are then either given by a predefined system or arbitrarily allotted some of those inventory that the guild has won as a whole. And a lot of the governance mechanisms of guilds are relatively implicit. And one other important point is that guilds exist cross game world. So it's not necessarily just a guild in the context of World of Warcraft or Ultima Online, but it can be something that spans even decades or game worlds or otherwise. So this is one guild called the Syndicate. It was founded in 1996, it's still around today. It was originally planned for one game, but then became kind of, you know, really dominant in Ultima Online, but they still hop around from World of Warcraft, and now some of the guilds are moving on to Fortnite. So it's a really resilient group of online people, most of whom have never met each other in person. So there's something in the kind of focus of looking at guilds, decentralization, and cooperatives that open a space for political design. And personally, I don't necessarily, I think it's really important to articulate like your own personal theory of change and how you enact change in the world. Um, so I don't personally see necessarily politics changing because policy has been enacted or someone else has kind of gone through a representative system. I don't not see it happening that way. But I also believe that like aesthetic narratives and aesthetic practices propel governance and political change as much as strict policy making does. And so what I think happens here is that what guilds bring is a kind of narrative world. And if we look at the kind of online virtual presence, whether it's in Second Life, World of Warcraft or otherwise, and unfortunately often um, kind of white hyper feminized sexualized forms, um, we do see, though, an opening for a form of identity that is not one-to-one -one with our real-world identity that could be quite interesting for this political space. So there's Hatsune Miku um, by a Japanese media company. Vocaloid Software performs as a character, and people can kind of um, compose for her. Um, there's also Otherkin, which is an online community uh, based around a shared belief that um, your individual identity is somehow more than human, often kind of a composite of a mythological creature or others. There's also Lil Michaela, which is a CGI influencer who was kind of born on Instagram, releases songs on Spotify, total marketing tool. And then more and more, I think we'll see kind of pop stars and celebrities creating their own avatars, either to perform alongside them or to enact a concept or even to go on tour for them. And also, kind of closer to home, um, Project Space Trust in Berlin, which Arthur and others run, um, just recently announced their first virtual resident. Um, so GVN908 will produce Twitch live streams and other narrative forms. And I really enjoyed this announcement because they describe themselves not as necessarily one resident, but a collection of online personae. So in this confluence of kind of online guilds, narrative worlds, shared post-human identity, uh, avatars or otherwise, community ownership of decentralized software, and novel legal forms, I think these are all components of something like an emergent, protocol-based, organizational structure with political relevance. And why I combine guilds with co-ops is that guilds have a really strong narrative component, but don't necessarily have, you know, in the kind of Ethereum founding story where he cried himself to sleep because one of his spells was disabled by a centralized service, guilds don't necessarily have a co-ownership model, and they don't have control of the platforms that they use. So if you combine that with a cooperative ethos and more decentralized tech, what do you get? So I think we'll see something like the rise of decentralized avatar organizations where people find kind of collective political virtual identity design at the intersection of online guilds, technical decentralization, and cooperative ownership models. And that this will allow people from different kind of political or categorical groups to be able to articulate their identity in a complex and shifting way that doesn't necessarily fit forms of mainstream, heteronormative, or otherwise identities that exist now. And I, I just see this as an implicit thing that we're going more towards and that it will actually have true political impact and relevance in the kind of decade to come. But it's always important to remember that when we're designing software systems, that it doesn't necessarily liberate us from any system. Um, and so a lot of people see blockchain as a kind of institutional, f like, you know, the end of all institutions. But protocols themselves always have affordances and limitations and sometimes even more implicit and dangerous ones because we can't see them as operating in kind of four columns and walls. So I just always like to caveat, um, I'm not necessarily, s I think that these tools can be used equally for good, bad, aesthetic, unmapped, or otherwise territory. Um, but just remember that the protocol becomes its own form of mediating institution in all of this work is really important. And that's it. Um, and I just compiled some further resources if you want to take a look. Um, 
So the first one is modular politics. So this is by Nathan Schneider, who wrote the Exits Community piece, but also with Primavera de Filippi, Seth Frey, Joshua Ten. Um, so it's looking at how you can have like modular politics in game design or different online communities where you kind of pick and play different governance forms. It's really great. Um, there's a piece, It Girls, by Carrie Doran on the kind of problematic nature of avatars and marketing today. Um, playing to Win about Minecraft servers by Alice Maz. Um, Jesse Walden from Co-ops or Crypto Networks. All of these are kind of relevant to the things I'm talking about. And that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much to both of the, the speakers. Um, I think both of you, um, before opening the question to the floor, um, both of you talked about incentive design, which seems to be uh, the core of um, structuring the incentives for um, for really the agency of designers. Could you, maybe for the people that are not so uh, familiar with the term, could you unpack it uh, a little bit from uh, the perspective, of course, of ownership uh, that you, Arthur, have been uh, often dealt with in your projects, and from the part of, uh, from the perspective of narratives, really, that is uh, Kia's uh, starting point? Um, I mean, I think that uh, within blockchain uh, specifically, uh, incentive design often relates to aligning financial incentives. Um, I don't think that is, a, I mean, that's a often a problematic assumption, um, but it's often how, basically in a decentralized system, how you produce a certain outcome um, by aligning the kind of financial, let's say, positive and negative uh, kind of feedback loops in a way that produces a certain outcome, uh, a bit like a labyrinth uh, with, uh, with positive and negative uh, corners. Um, I think that uh, incentive design is also widely implemented in online gaming, um, where it has a much wider kind of um, um, meaning uh, and uh, um, covers both implicit and explicit uh, incentive design. Uh, both in terms of narratives, in terms of like uh, seeing things larger than you, and I think this also connects to your, uh, I mean, the the duality of narratives and protocol design. I think that in blockchain there is a like the incentive design that that is used in games or understood in games around like narratives are largely overlooked within blockchain today, or or at least coded often as protocol design when it's actually narrative. Yeah, for sure. And I think a lot of people use the term incentive design in blockchain um, because there's this concept of kind of game theory. <laughs> Sorry, there's like a funny meme about this that I can't, whenever I say game theory, I can't help but think of. Um, but so it's the idea that um, in certain scenarios, people are unlikely to cooperate with each other. Um, so because they have different self-interests. So if you can use incentive design to somehow kind of trap people into rational self-interest and force them thereby to work with each other. <laughs> so it's this kind of, um, often you get the word incentive design from a rationalist belief that humans must be coerced in order to overcome cooperative challenges. And I think that a lot of that comes from inheriting kind of game theoretical models that don't necessarily happen um, or occur in open systems. They generally occur in closed systems, which were being studied as such. Um, so I think uh, a lot of people's work within blockchain that are working kind of more from my perspective um, are trying to look at like what are the aesthetics of game theory and what does that look like in practice? So looking at LARPing or other forms um, because once you kind of put game theory or um, disincentives cooperate on an aesthetic form, then it becomes kind of laughable to think that um, coordination can be coerced from a technical protocol. Yeah, I, I, from a personal reference, uh, we, we want, we, when I worked within the blockchain field more actively, um, uh, we did tests on exactly this, which is like, I think the most successful thing we did was uh, creating a little game on top of the protocol that had no value at all, 
rather than changing or aligning the financial incentives. Uh, and it was totally mind blowing to uh, to m yeah many people outside of the or yeah out in the blockchain space. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the DXDAO project that I mentioned, it's built on the DAO stack protocol. So the DAO stack protocol has about you know 20 different categories of overlapping and combined incentives that are built into the protocol that are not worth going into. But it's the idea that um, if you vote in a, on a proposal that passes, you will get more voting power for the next proposal. And then on top of these proposals, there's, there's also markets to predict with real financial incentives whether a proposal will pass or not. And if it predicts that a proposal will pass, that proposal is boosted and then thus more likely to pass. Um, so a lot of this was developed almost in a laboratory style setting and then kind of put out into the wild. And I think it shows a lot of promise, but needs to be tested in more discreet ways with real people and real gamified narratives for it to have meaning. <laughs> yeah, also w one, one interesting thing that, um, that's why probably you Arthur probably would rather frame it not really as incentive design but as ownership design um, as basically also in in your project and also other projects you're mm, you're rather rather than really incent i mean incentives are just a mean to um, produce collective assets it seems to me uh, i mean um yeah i think in the two projects i mentioned i would say that the like they are still designed from uh, a perspective of like personal interest of uh, people that participate in the network uh, and then tries to like, but tries to produce an outcome that is most favorable to the people in the network, which is like the collective ownership of it. Uh, so I guess it's part of like the narrative and the incentive design is this kind of ultimate goal of collective ownership. If that is compelling or not is, Unclear, but yeah. Had one one remark also for uh, for Kia. Um, one one thing that came out that uh, s struck me while you were talking about it um, was you were talking basically about um, tokens as as voting, and uh, and that. Um, I mean, the connection I made in that case was, of course, with uh, with, identi with identification. That is um, potentially in 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 collision with uh, the the philosophy itself of of permissionless networks of of the blockchain. Is it so, or uh if if token-based voting is somehow not permissionless, or uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, actually, so I'm working with Yalda Museveniva, who does a project called Artark that's really great. It's a DAO project. We're working on a DAO taxonomy, um, so trying to kind of map different qualities of DAOs and governance on blockchain. And one thing that we found is um, that in terms of all DAOs have like voting systems, and often um, that voting system is different depending on the DAO, but it can be something. Um, you know, if you have one address that holds a particular type of token related to the DAO, you have one vote. Um, there are ones that if you hold more of that token, you have more of a vote. There's, and then there's ever more fine grain kind of logic around token voting. Um, there's issues more around, um, you know, civil resistance and being able to create infinite identities and then game voting. Mm -hmm. But people actually see in blockchain um, the, the ability to kind of go on an exchange, a decentralized exchange without identity to get a token and then to use that token to then participate in an organization as relatively permissionless. They actually see that as a feature that's, that defines permissionless exit and entrance. In terms of acquiring a token, you have entrance. Whereas, you know, membership of traditional organizations, usually you have to provide an identity document. Usually there's some form of membership fee, thinking of small cooperatives that I've been a part of. Um, so it, that token membership people actually use as a definition of permissionless often. Um, I don't personally agree with that. I think, you know, there's obvious economic, technical, social, or other hurdles to acquiring a token um, that are equally as permissionful as other forms of joining an organization. Great. Uh, I hope there are questions actually from the audience. Uh, I think you should really seize the opportunity to fire.
So um, thanks for, uh, for the talks. Uh, we were we were speaking earlier that um, about uh, Yaya Kara Breke, whom some in the room uh, already know. She's I would say she comes a bit more from political science, maybe thinking uh, about blockchain. And um, and one time I, I don't remember if it was in an article in a conversation. Um, she said that actually, you know, as you were speaking about blockchain technologies, you know, seems to disintermediate a lot, but she would argue the opposite, that actually overlaying blockchain, like many, many verticals, many things in society with blockchain actually requires a certain supply chain of servers, etc., that creates even more intermediation. So s since your two talks, I would like to hear your opinion on, on this kind of statement she made and uh, how you feel about it. I mean, I don't think that blockchains um, add any less or more intermediary layers, especially on like longer time horizons. I think that they are one technical system. I think that the flaw in that kind of thinking that they disintermediate social institutions is more of the conflation with, I mean, blockchain was invented or pieced together to solve a technical problem of distributed computation of how do you get a bunch of computers to gr agree on the same state and the same history without having a centralized coordinating node. And it was really a problem of computation. And now there is a strong conflation with that problem of computation solving social factors of intermediation. And I think that the tie one-to-one -one there, J Jaya really wonderfully explicates this whenever she speaks, the tie one-to-one -one there does not compute. <laughs> Um, I think that that's just actually just a huge um, misnomer in terms of expecting the form of a technical system to in any way influence the social system, or not in any way, but for one form to directly follow from a given technical system is flawed. Hey, so um, it was really interesting to hear your perspectives on uh, the way how it's related to design and like future horizon. So I think it's clear now that there is a common belief that blockchain and DAO systems uh, have this promise to change the way how civil society cooperate overall like with day-to-day -to -day things like maybe like in more like physical world not in virtual world this is a big promise and uh, for this to happen it cannot happen instantly because this is like a very novel technology what's your take on that like how do you think what should happen to make it real faster? Like so that it will be more integrated into real world for uh, common people, not for computer science people or for people from design uh, community. Um, yeah, uh, that's the question. What's your take on that? I mean, I think our two perspectives are a very let's say, are very much going towards that direction. If you would survey the general blockchain space, I don't think they, uh, uh, like, co collective institution building uh, is not, maybe there's a more more uh, focus on individual agency sometimes than, uh, let's say, um, agency expressed to um, collectively owned uh, institutions or the responsibilities that come with that, maybe. Um, so I, I don't know if this is like a direct could be directly mapped into the promises of the general blockchain space. Um, I think um, there is something interesting there, though, uh, uh, in that um, in that we both map that out. Um, and I think what what needs to happen is that that yeah that institutional design expressed through these things becomes a new design space and more people starting in, in and acting with it for that to happen. I don't think that's there yet. Uh, there is, I mean, there is things happening in the in the blockchain space. Um, I mean, Kia has, has touched on some of that stuff, but I feel like the idea of like, let's say solidarity-based economics or like what the kind of social institutions that we, we take for granted today look like in these forms seems like still somewhat unexplored space often. Um, so that's like what I, if, if we're talking about the same thing, that's something I would like to see. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, with the danger of saying something that could be misconstrued, I'm wondering about the need for kind of common applications of blockchain, even to some extent. Um, I think that it would be nice if we see certain positive benefits that I could see blockchain bringing in terms of different ownership models of platforms from the start. Um, and also different kind of narrative models of what it means to participate in a, in a community. Um, if that 
if those can come as kind of cultural knock-on effects and blockchain itself never um, gets used widely at scale, that's fine with me. Um, to me, I want to see the social ends before I see the technical implementation. And that said, I work you know, at a tech company. I'm working on it every day. It's not that I discount the, the need for that. Um, but I just think that you know, it's like, what is your theory of change? Why and to what ends? And what is the best way to accomplish those ends? I do think um, that using it within software is the first immediate use case and just try to get it better there so that it can be more usable for people to care about. Because right now, it's still difficult to use software. Um, and to, to think that people would automatically be interested in it is wrong. Um, so I would like to see the knock-on social effects and the kind of institutional reform, whether it's um, you know every app has a blockchain behind it, um, I'm less committed to. Um, I, and, and I know that's not exactly what you're asking, but that's just, yeah, my feeling. Um, and just, uh, I hope that like one, if it were to get to the point where every app has a blockchain behind it and there's n no intermediate third party, I, I hope that users don't have to know that. I hope that there's like other cultural norms around it. Um, is, is Kia yeah. uh, related to the me metaphor about, or the uh, origin story that you were talking about with the World of Warcraft? Um, Excuse my ignorance on this this topic, but so I, I might have misunderstood. But if, uh, say, like in that situation, it had already been collectively owned, um, would that be something like what would the interface for solving or bringing back something that like he liked look like? Would it be sort of like a message board? Like, is it, is it like the way we have like forums now, or like a subreddit, or what would it look like? Yeah, so I super appreciate this question. It's a wonderful question. Um, so I think it could look like a bunch of different things. There isn't one answer yet. I think the closest um, metaphor that I could see is actually in the blockchain space at the moment. So how it exists is that there's just a bunch of different computers, like nodes, running parts of the network, and they verify and keep the network as one like continuous state. Um, but if the if the kind of community wants to upgrade the software that's being run on that network. Um, all of those nodes have to switch to the upgrade. And also all of the core devs have to kind of coordinate to implement those changes to the network. And then the, a lot of the wider community also has to assent and signal that they will commit to those changes. So it's actually, for blockchains, um, it's, it's a mixture of, in terms of concrete platforms, it's all of those people talking over Hangouts, talking over Twitter, talking over forums. It's also devs coding, looking at GitHub, seeing the repository code has been implemented, it's been audited. And so in the, if that were ported to looking at um, having the Siphon Life spell nuked, <laughs> um, it would require like much more coordination to have something that people cared about taken away so easily. If it was something that people didn't really care about, it's quite likely that it would like socially just fade away and maybe be implemented in the next network upgrade. That said, like this, this model of kind of blockchain updates and upgrades, there could be a lot of other models too. Um, but that's one way in it which it would preserve like a community consensus about whether um, you know damage for a given spell would be increased or decreased. And like right now in Ethereum, everyone's super mad about this prog pow minor thing, and like go some people probably can't sleep. And it's like um, you could imagine that in World of Warcraft and community involvement in terms of those spells being upgraded or not. So. Uh, can you both say something about the, the tension between, let's say, uh, you know, automation and um, decision making and voting? Uh, there, I there is an inherent danger that uh, there is some kind of inflation of uh, voting that you have to vote all the time and and more and more and more. Uh, on the other hand, the system, you know, also offers the possibility uh, of all these things to be automated and. This is what uh, you know in Austria, Slovenia, some philosophers call interpassivity, where you kind of enjoy uh, that you don't have to be active all the time uh, and and asked, you know, sh uh, to, to vote. Uh, is do you see this uh, tension? I mean, um, I th do, do you mean as a, as that many of these proposals carry in them this kind of? Well, let's let's talk about it when things scale up. Right. I mean, maybe the, the the very small active community at the very beginning eh, might look at it very uh, differently. But uh, do you, do you mean in terms of like uh, um, uh, voting within these systems, or like the 
the kind of thing that Kia talked about, which is like upgrading the system, because there are there are ways to just delegate there. I mean, there is also the way to de delegative democracy. Do we want to delegate? Do we want representation, uh, or do we want uh, you know direct involvement? Well, that's for th for for. I mean, that's decided on a, on a on a system system basis. I'm I think d uh, delegated democracy is kind of good in some use cases if it's uh, accountable. I mean, uh, and transparent. I don't have a problem with that. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. I mean, I think liquid democracy is a great model um, mm. where you choose trusted delegates and not necessarily even on like a national scale, but you could choose it on a policy-based scale. You won't say like, I, w I want to delegate my vote to this person on all issues related to climate in this sector of the world, and then done. Um, a lot of people in blockchain space, while are <laughs> relatively naive about some things, are relatively well educated on this stuff in terms of... Um, there's voter apathy is a well-known problem, um, so that people don't want to have to vote on the most minor things. Um, so that's trying, that's in certain like DAOs, that's tried to take into account where like um, you only need a quorum if it's contentious vote. If the vote flips over a certain amount of time, like within a 24-hour period, if the vote flips from yes to no several times, then a larger quorum or a larger amount of people are needed to vote on that decision because it's viewed as a contentious decision. So there are small mechanisms like this, but similarly, I don't want to say that one across the board. I feel like what these systems open up and what the um, piece by Primavera and Nathan and et al. kind of opens up with modular politics is being able to, people kind of plug and play to test different governance solutions and which work in different contexts and it's a sandbox for that. And then we'll, I think we'll see in like 10 years the fruits of what those experiments are, but it will be a while. Because a lot of people don't care and I think everyone has a right to not care. Yeah, that uh, th this delegation uh, uh, discussion, uh, which was raised by Arthur, brings me to the question that uh, um, you said earlier that there has been a lot of critic uh, uh, on, say, the application of blockchain, in the sense that a lot of things exist already in one form or another. And uh, uh, when I listen to you, I I I, I view a, a huge complexification. Uh, uh, of mechanism of uh, decision making, of participation. And uh, as you said, people have the right not, uh, <laughs> not, not to be bothered about that. So where is the advance? And, uh, 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 what, what, what could, you, uh, could you maybe elaborate on the criticism uh, saying that, well, a lot of these things have been done before. And indeed, I'm thinking, for instance, in terms of a notary, uh, well, a good notary is doing things in a certain sense in a sim simpler way than the blockchain is doing in the sense that um, people trust and they don't have to understand it. And, uh, and uh, 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 this whole uh, blockchain sphere, I think for majority of the people, not, not here in this room, but for the majority of the people is a real, what, what the Dutch call a far from my bad show and something they would like, maybe would like to keep it like that. I mean, in, in terms of notary, and I'm not a defendant of this position, but I think the, the fintech or the, uh, the like startup uh, reaction to that will be you can automate that job by a blockchain. So you don't need that third party. I'm not, again, I'm not a defendant of that, but I think that's what drives some of the motivation behind that. Um, yeah, that would be. <laughs> uh, so I think cost saving automation, uh, um, and uh, in some cases, especially between like transnational or as uh, with the union example, for example, um, there are no like legal frameworks. Um, so that's, that's a use case, for example. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think on two levels, I think there's one benefit which I experienced and I don't th expect everyone to experience this benefit, but maybe, well, I'll get to the second part, but like the, the guild DAO with the Gnosis safe that I showed where it's basically a kind of four of us have a shared bank account. So we set that up, that web page up, um, in about 60 seconds, you can deploy that, and you suddenly have a shared bank account with different crypto funds, and four of your friends have control of that bank account. And we're planning to use it for small arts grants funding, um, and to do kind of a series of rounds every quarter. And we already have a shared pool of funds, and we have a voting system in place for distributing those funds elsewhere. And so for me, previously, I did things like um, start small cooperatives. 
Um, and to get a shared bank account took about a year and a half and a lot of time and a lot of money. And we were just a small cooperative. And to find one place that would kind of accept that we didn't really have a profit revenue structure and that people from different nationalities would in some way be part of this organization was really difficult. Um, so that is kind of the old like bank the unbanked model that I think is like problematic in certain ways. But for me in this small context was really helpful. But I do think there's certain things like, you know, also for the cooperative, I put together like an articles of association. And I really loved it because I used a template from, um, what is it called, Seeds for Change in the UK, which just does all cooperative, in, in English, all cooperative structures. And you can just easily fork that template and institute your own. And that almost felt like a, a blockchain experience to me. But what I see that's in combination with both of these forms is that they produce design patterns in the world. So like you're able to take something that someone's already done and then immediately work off the back of what they've already done and then work on the next thing. So if it isn't necessarily that the tech institutes, like everyone has shared bank accounts now, the concept of being able to more easily create shared bank accounts will, I think, promote in the future a more egalitarian cultural form of finance. And I don't see that that cultural form will exist for another 10 years. I think it's like trickle down cultural. But I think that the main benefits will ultimately be it will, there will also be drawbacks, but the main benefits from our kind of circles it will be cultural. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, <coughs> trying to uh, lower the thresholds for designers might be uh, an option to use uh, the blockchain as a service, which is commercially available from Amazon and, and, uh, and Azure. So the enterprise blockchain as a service and blockchain as a service. How do you fancy these kind of, well, technology levels? It, it, it lowers down and perhaps some kind of killer app will arise because you don't need any software skills anymore. Well, less. Well, I think there's also cool projects like one project, Dapnode, where you can basically plug a little thing. It's open source hardware and open source software and you plug it into a wall and you set up a few, few configs and it's an Ethereum node. Super awesome, those guys are amazing. Um, so <laughs> in terms of what I think about kind of Amazon and Azure and all of these other things, well, it depends. Um, I, don't think, I don't think it's awful. <laughs> um, I definitely am a fan of lowering the barrier to entry and people maintaining nodes. Yeah. Um, I would just like it to see it go, see it go away that maybe um, you know, operating system maintenance or other open source maintenance um, unfortunately went poorly in some ways where people <coughs> felt more alienated from the tech than um, empowered by it. So I think, sorry, this is a diversion, probably doesn't answer the question, but one book I love and to think through all this stuff is uh, Tools for Conviviality by Ivan Illich. So he does this um, analysis of the car. This, sorry, this is total side note, but um, <laughs> he does this analysis of the car and says it, um, like the net actual speed of a car when you calculate the cost of gas, the time you spend at work, the repairs, mechanical manufacturing, the supply chain, et cetera, is about two kilometers per hour. <laughs> um, and so he, he does like an analysis of modern technology of, that actually produces conviviality and our, how we misconstrue it for speed or efficiency. Um, so I would love an analysis to look at like what you know pop-up blockchains or blockchain as a service does in a convivial way or a non-convivial way. Um. <laughs> I'm just generally curious, who's already active in a DAO in, in, in this room? Like, who is actively participating in a DAO? Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I'm just curious because it's, uh, I'm the second one then, <laughs> and it gives a lot of insight to just do it. And then from from those insights you learn and you start to use them better and better. Um, so I really like advise everybody to, to just start one, and then from there on the knowledge and the, the understanding of what what you are talking about is like going is skyrocketing.
Well, I can give an answer. Uh, it's it's digital, so you can have complete different way of engaging people. It's borderless, so you can cooperate with people all over the globe. Um, well, those are just two things you cannot do in regular physical football clubs, for example. Um, and you can get, in my opinion, a balanced governance, um, which is not the case now in the first wave of digital organizations. So that's a few takes from my side. Hello. Uh, <laughs> so basically, like if we looked at uh, if we look at the um, like uh, 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 crypto coin um, sort of uh, uh, blockchain diversity in the past that seemed to be like the most popular and widespread use of blockchain technology and also a lot of people I feel like sort of projected this type of um, financial governance onto the future as like a better alternative and it ended up having like so many different versions that there was a uh, in it a uh, like alternative financial market made that actually ended up like being pretty negative I think in the in the long run or in the sh short run I don't know <laughs> how it how it ended up I felt um, uh, so wouldn't the the blockchain technology, if it was to encompass like a lot of different um, areas of like society, culture, and um, finance, uh, wouldn't it be better if there was like one singular blockchain that would encompass all of these together? And if you had multiple different blockchain systems um, for uh, different activities, um, wouldn't like just a similar market system develop as we criticize today in the neoliberal society? <laughs> if I don't know if this is like I a mean, logical I question. I mean, there or are. Not. So um, I'm. I think Kian knows more about this than me. But there are. Uh, um, I mean, yes, there was a large bubble, and a lot of those projects should maybe never have been started. Um, um, <laughs> Most of them, 99% probably. Um, mm, and um, that's not the part I thought you would know more about. I'm going to get to that. <laughs> that. That was like a harsh burn if I, if I tried to say that. That was not what I tried to say. Um, um, but uh, there, are, there are, I mean, uh, if you think about protocols uh, as like in their nature, uh, they're intended to um, kind of uh, be like the standard. So they're, they're, they're better if they are generally uh, used uh, across a, a whole industry because then uh, that creates efficiencies, right? Um, but there, uh, as far as I know, there are also uh, a lot of projects to be able to basically create interoperability between existing blockchains. So you could have a variety of uh, blockchains um, by different development teams that then are interoperable with each other. So you can transfer funds between them and stuff like that. So there isn't a kind of uh, a need uh, for, for a winner-takes-all model. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I pretty much agree with that. I think um, in terms of, so you mentioned the programmable money. That was one of the early narratives of Ethereum. Another early narrative of Ethereum was um, world's computer. So it was the idea that you have one kind of monolithic blockchain to end all blockchains. It's public, transparent, all transactions are on that chain. Um, but there's some technical limitations in terms of scalability with that. And I also have always kind of felt that um, uh, interoperability is much more important than um, kind of one chain takes all. Um, so to me, whether there's, as long as the kind of transactions and records are public and accessible and de decentrally maintained up to a certain threshold um, is what I care about, that they are then interoperable with each other. To me, they, I think it would be nice actually the more chains possible as long as there was interoperability preserved between them and if they had the same kind of level and threshold of decentralization and non-co-option and participation, um, which is obviously a lot to ask for, but I, I, I actually get more worried about the kind of one blockchain to rule them all in terms of just how we see like verti vertical integration of corporations today. To me, that market f logic tends to be kind of like, you know, the, the false support of natural monopolies. Um, I would like to see more um, unnatural cooperatives, I guess. <laughs>
So um, one thing that's somewhat unfortunate at the moment, um, and this is so something I, I do at work at my day job, um, is we just um, got the go-ahead from Gibraltar to release the first fully regulated prediction markets, so blockchain-based financial markets. Um, and through that process, we had to satisfy KYC and AML. AML is anti-money laundering. So you have to satisfy up to a certain degree that you can trace and tra track transactions. And the issue with blockchain at the moment is actually that it is not that anonymous. Um, so you have unique IDs. There's a public record of all of those IDs interacting with each other. And if you wanted to trace kind of certain cash funds up to a reasonable degree, you could. Um, so that's why there's new tech. And, and I would say that there's, there's two sides of this. There's new tech like mixers coming out. So the idea of um, you mix a transaction with a bunch of other people and it anonymizes that transaction and then sends it where it needs to be. And then there's another way of dealing with it, which um, are like zero knowledge proofs. So the idea that um, kind of personal identifying information is never stored on the chain itself in the public record, but there is a way to cryptographically access that information for the chain. Um, so to me, I am personally a privacy advocate because I see a lot of ways um, that money laundering happens regardless of financial infrastructure. And I think that um, Blockchain is probably more transparent, not less than our existing financial infrastructure, which is also has its unfortunateness. Um, so, um, yeah, I, f I feel like it's a little bit of a misnomer. It's something that I feel like um, that narrative to some extent w allows kind of like banks and nation states and existing hegemons to kind of get the leg up on blockchain in the interim. <laughs> um, and yeah, this is something I kind of have to, to look into on a daily basis. And um, yeah, I just do believe that it empowers potentially more than it could destruct um, yeah. it, on a, um, if it were to be private. Yeah. So thank you, first of all. Um, Kia, in your talk, you, you mentioned um, that the DAO space had a bit to learn from sort of previous forms of distributed organization and um, obviously talking about guilds and Arthur and your your talk you're talking about unions what would you say are like the lessons from the past that the space hasn't learned and what are some of the interesting um, things happening prior to DAOs that have not been translated into the into the space I mean for me collective bargaining as like an important tool uh, is something that I feel has been, in my opinion, been overlooked um, within projects. Um, I also think that, yeah, um, I mean, um, there is an over-reliance on financial uh, incentivization and uh, like rational economic uh, uh, user. Um, I think those two are pretty big things. I think there is a narrative around um, individual agency um, by uh, access to market, um, um, which um, is not fully true. Um, those are three three things for me. Yeah, and I guess one thing, um, there's a bunch of things, but one thing that hasn't been mentioned is that um, I think the use of the term smart contracts has made a lot of, um, particularly devs or people building in this space think that smart contracts have some form of legal legitimacy and some sort of contractual binding. And while they might um, automatically execute, they don't necessarily have automatic standing in court for that execution. So um, there's been a lot of overlooking, and I think that kind of misnomer led down people, people down the space to think that through the blockchain, they're establishing new kind of a legal norm and autonomous legal space that can enact its own jurisdictional force. Um, and not seeing that ultimately the, the final arbitrator for a smart contract is still a national court. And it's the national court where those people reside. And it's also probably the U.S. still at the moment. Um, and that's, you know, I'm not an advocate of that. But um, usually kind of if you're going to trace it back, if there's going to be a major litigation, it will be decided by trickle, like kind of um, 
cultural repetition of repeating legal norms from the US elsewhere when it comes to financial services. So I'd say that people have a lot to learn in terms of legal formations, looking at um, you know, just simple cooperative structures limited by shares, et cetera. And there's been a real um, tendency to totally neglect the legal reality in the world <laughs> for the sake of um, autonomous, self-executing smart contracts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it blows people's minds. <laughs> Hello, I have a question for Osoy, uh, and uh, I would like to uh, ask you to reflect on trust. It's in your, uh, uh, the name of the organization. Uh, and uh, many of the things that you also, pre both of you presented uh, are actually uh, mechanisms to, to minimize the need for trust. But what we are dealing with is social organization, which is based on trust. So the more rigid structures uh, you uh, rely on, the less trust you actually need to have. But uh, uh, it is unclear for me whether all these utopian expectations can be realized actually without trusting each other. Uh, with or without technology. So, I, like, why did you choose trust? You mean as a name? Um, funnily enough, the space was called trust when we took it over, and it was such a fitting name that we took it. Uh, uh, that's the simple answer to that question. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, but I'm going to answer. I, I mean, uh, I think, I think, like, we called the space trust because of the actual. I mean, the 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 need for a physical space and the need to build up, a, let's say, a local community what felt like a, almost like an interesting contrast to the kind of work many of us were doing. Um, so calling it that was a play on that, I would say. Um, I, I think that, like, yeah, the, 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 this idea of trustless uh, networks uh, uh, and this uh, disintermediation, uh, yeah, I understand the, 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 the fear or, let's say, the this this kind of like if if you train people to not have any kind of uh, relations that are not contractual anymore, what kind of society do we end up with? Uh, uh, which I guess is a is a legitimate fear um, that like bureaucracy kind of fosters a culture of self interest if it only views people as uh, being able to be coerced into social situations or so solidarity by their own self interest in these kind of legal systems. So yeah, I would say. Um, where I find it interesting is in, in like scale issues, where where trust falls apart, or what we normally see, like how we um, relate to each other falls apart, or the social frameworks fall apart at scale. And there, it seems like the the blockchain can only solve a part. And there's like with the vertical union example, for example, it's it's clear that it needs a narrative that a narrative part or a cultural kind of proposal for how these uh, unions work in combination uh, uh, with a technical proposal like this. Like what is the, how is solidarity defined between the members of a union of that scale, both in terms of like inter, uh, between industries uh, and sectors and also transnational and how, well, yeah, what is the culture around that and what is the trust between them sometimes? So I feel like it's a dual. Yeah, I would just say super quickly is that through the DAO experiments I've participated in, I find myself having to trust people that I work with and friends more. Um, I, I don't think it disintermediates trust between kind of closer relationships. I think it disintermediates just, yeah, it, to me it made me closer with people. <laughs> um, because you have to trust that they will help take care of things. Great. I don't know if there is one last question. Nothing to say. We've exhausted the program then. Um, I wanted to say thank you very much uh, also to the funds that supported us for, for this night and for the, the series, uh, which are stimulating funds, AFK, uh, the film funds, uh, SVDJ, and indeed to um, Submarine Channel. And I think actually the conversation can continue down at the bar. So thank you very much and see you the next event on the 1st of April.